Welcome, everybody. I'm Love Coach Scott Gary Thomas here with my teaching partner, Trish Wright, and the twin rays, Shakina and Sananda. Uh, I have been blessed to be spending time with them. I'm going to go to gallery view. Yeah, we're on gallery view. Um, these last few days, I'm with them in their home. And yes, that really is their temple. It's not uh, a Zoom backdrop. <laughs> and uh, uh, people were asking, people said, is that really their home or is that just a really cool Zoom backdrop? It's the real deal. And they're the real deal. Uh, it's been really very inspiring for me to spend time, many, many hours talking, conversing, getting to know them. And so I want to welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to take uh, questions. Um, and I see we've already got about 45, about 50 people in the Zoom with us. A lot of old friends, a lot of new friends. So welcome everybody. And also for those of you watching on Facebook, um, I will post the Zoom room number in uh, when they're chatting and you can actually go into the Zoom room if you wish. It's a little easier to interact that way. Um, mm -hmm. And the topic of tonight is all about sovereignty. And I think before I ask the big question to Shakina and Sananda, I'm gonna put the spotlight on my partner, Trish here for a moment, just to kind of give an, an update of what her office looks like. No, um, <laughs> she's very proud of her new office and her new light and this is very exciting. Trish, since we're talking about sovereignty, I would love to just get your kind of summation of our last show on sovereignty and some of where, where we stood and then we'll turn it over to our guests. Hmm. Well, the reason why we had the last show on sovereignty was because I had heard a lot of the, the spiritual community or my greater spiritual community use sovereignty as a way to be really selfish and to like not really consider everyone else like, oh, I'm in my sovereign being and I'm just going to do whatever I want, you know? And, um, and I was like, well, I don't know if that's actually the way it is. And I'm, I'm curious if, if that's what, um, you know, spiritual teachers are teaching. Um, and so when we, we got a few really, you know, beautiful, powerful teachers to come on and share about their understanding and their, their definition and their moving forward of sovereignty. And it really, it kind of came down to the idea that, that sovereignty is something that we individually and universally share, that we're, we're working towards sovereignty as well, like sovereignty in being, sovereignty in, as a as a human creation, in the considering of others and the world and the universe. Like there's, it's 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 a more global de definition of sovereignty or a more universal definition of sovereignty, sovereignty rather than this very individualistic mm -hmm. thought about it. And I and it really struck me like it, it felt good, you know, like for someone who is driven by connection and driven to show up and help people, um, especially people who uh, aren't as privileged as I am. Like it's to know that I, I can still think about and consider others in my sovereignty. And actually that's in alignment with, with a spiritual practice, right? without being codependent or giving oneself away in um, obligatory ways. So that's kind of where we came to. And I'm glad that you you picked sovereignty because that's a, a beautiful, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a really beautiful, I mean, again, I'm not you know, I haven't watched it. It was, it was months ago, so I'm not doing a very good job at <laughs> boiling it all down, but that's what I gathered from it. How do you, how do you feel about that, Scott? Like, what do you think? Beautiful. I, uh, I want to just invite, thank you. We've got lots of people in the Zoom room now, over 60. Let us know where you're from. It's always good to know where people are geographically. Um, 
And I just want to turn it over to Shakin and Sananda. And I want to say I'm very, very impressed with how they are experiencing life. Um, and, you know, there's nothing like staying with people to kind of see who they really are, what their home is like. Their home is incredible. It's exquisite. But more importantly, they're really beautiful, beautiful beings. So, um, like Trish said, they picked the topic. And so I'm going to put the spotlight on Shakina and Sananda and ask you to please tell us from your perspective as, as teachers, what is true spiritual sovereignty really mean? Thank you, both of you. And Trish, your purpose for choosing sovereignty and wanting to talk about sovereignty is absolutely true. It's alive and it is happening in spiritual communities at a rapid rate. And for us, we understand sovereign as reigning over the lower mind, lower ego. And of course, there is this great pendulum swing happening right now in the world as a collective, it's a grand collective, where there has been, you know, political oppression and worldly oppression and, and of course, and now the pendulum is swinging to the other side as all dualistic, polarized realities do, and they always will. And so for us, now it's time to really bring about the middle path, right? So it's not about being on one side and then picking up arms and being on the other, because neither one is a true spiritual path. And, you know, we speak to the spiritual adult uh, that understands that there is no such thing truly as sovereignty from the ego perspective and from the conditioned mind. And as we always say, unconditional love unconditions the mind. And so from this space, we can speak a little bit more about it. And I'd like to hand this over to my brothers. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the notion of sovereignty is very much from a, the individual perspective. That's what we speak into is that that's a, that's a false notion because the individuals in divide, basically the individuals in divided by the uh, belief that they're separate from others. So when the collective evolves to a perspective where everyone's human rights are naturally dharmic and there's a beautiful righteousness that arises within any governmental body or any, any sort of structural. community structural mm -hmm. design and, and people's true nature is blossoming, then notions of sovereignty don't really apply because don't really... Not, not really necessary. Now, on the world stage, sovereignty looks like a certain certain way. And the meaning of sovereignty, obviously, is that you have no control, you're sovereign beyond the government. So there's sovereign lands, there's sovereign sort of monarchies, and there's certain sovereignty from that, from that individual perspective. We're not interested in that. We're, we're really not interested in that at all. From That's our, not our job. Yeah, from our, from our perspective, sovereignty as beloved Shekinah has shared, is it's the soul reigning over the lower mind. It's the, the true self reigning supreme over the lower mind, the, the conditionings. But what we've come to understand through deep excavation and we are very, yes, initiated is one word and educated is another and knowledgeable about spiritual psychology. That's one of our favorite topics. It's our favorite subjects to really go deep into the excavation of the shadow side and the tendencies of the unconscious shadow nature um, of the psyche. And now when one has lived through the awareness of their mind and perceives themselves from an individual perspective there's no sovereignty there because the individual ego is in divide. It's in division, essentially. 
when you transcend that mind and you realize who you truly are as that illuminated self that is unchanging, that is the true essence of oneness, that is the ever-pervading consciousness supreme that everything truly is. But until one is realized at that level, what happens is the mind is consistently reconditioned again and again and again by the causal body. And the causal body or what, what we call the Akashic we, body. We call the Akashic body because it's basically the entire records of one's incarnational, from incarnations to incarnations. It holds every single, whether you believe in one incarnation or whether you believe in multiple incarnations or if believing in just every incarnation as one big lifetime with every single life sort of Happening inclusive in that. simultaneously yeah. and or concurrently. Yeah, whatever the belief is, it's sort of the mm -hmm. same thing, but that causal body the very deep basement of the unconscious mind is before the mind itself so that informs the mind and how we understand the mind is from a fourfold function the mind is memory it has individual the persona the the, the ego and when we speak of the ego, we're not speaking from the, from the Freudian or the Jungian perspective of self-image. We're speaking of just that sense of I, that I exist, that, that ego self um, that, that exists, whether it's neither positive or negative. It's just that, that, that understanding that there's an aliveness within you and that you perceive from that perspective, which is the very last thing that's transcended on the journey of enlightenment. Um, also, the intellect and the emotion. So that's sort of the heart mind as well. So, so we understand the mind as this fourfold construct as a tool. And before the mind, the mind is preconditioned by the causal body. And the causal body, the causal conditioning, again, holds all the information, whether it's cultural conditioning, societal conditioning, parental conditioning, ancestral conditioning, soul conditioning, all the different in conditionings that in, in the East is known as the samskaras. They're the impressions, they're the programs. That keep you coming back from lifetime to lifetime yeah. in order to clear, cleanse and purify yeah. into the soul becoming spirit. Yeah, so it's the latent tendencies or desires or aversions within the causal body that informs the mind then to perceive and conceive the world around it and inform the mind of how to actually really make sense of one's experience. So if that is in control <laughs> and the mind is saying, I'm sovereign and I'm declaring I'm sovereign and I'm affirming I'm sovereign and I'm doing affirmations and confirmations. That is and the antithesis of sovereignty. How, how can one truly be sovereign when they're not accessing the very preconditioning aspect that's actually informing their entire belief model of their world? So that's why we say that... that that model of sovereignty of I'm sovereign is a false model because it, it because it's creating a delusion and which the word delusion is basically thinking that the illusion of separation is real. Is real. It's the reality. So when one believes that the illusion of fear of separation is real, they become deluded in their perspective. And so that's more of a false, false narrative. So what we believe and what we've understood on the path is that true sovereignty is when you realize in totality that you are not the mind. You are not the limitations of the mind. Now you can utilize the mind as a powerful instrument, but the mind again is either a jailer or the liberator. You get to decide, but you have to go deep into the excavation of the unconscious mind to free yourself first. That's right. And the truth is that a truly sovereign being has no fight needed. The truly sovereign being knows the difference between what is real and what is unreal, what is truly spiritual and what is of the world. And what we're talking about and what you beloved Trish have been speaking about and Scott in your last conversation was all of the world. Spiritual is a whole other experience altogether. So yes. we want to give you time to share and speak as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm loving what you have to say, Trish. Mm. That's, that's part of where we were getting to with Bruce Lyon. 
Do you have you ever listened to Bruce's work at all? We have not had we the pleasure not, as such. Yeah. <laughs> that that when you move from this this particular human experience into the expanded view, the expanded understanding is that you are it's no longer about the self. And and I love that you shared it so eloquently. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, I, the question that I have is that, so, so you're speaking to not only just whoever's in this room, but a zillion people on Facebook, either now or recorded <laughs> later on, um, that let's say they're, they're gonna be in, in whatever trajectory of their spiritual growth that they're in and whatever they're choosing to to seek in the moment right i'm wondering what are some some pieces or what are some some things to help like wh wherever you are in your spiritual path where how can we move towards spiritual sovereignty and more mm -hmm. connected Yes. Does it make sense? Absolutely. And we say discernment. Yes. There's there's mm -hmm. the, the key is really the very beginning level of full acceptance to one's life. The mm -hmm. very beginning level of one's an authentic spiritual path of self-inquiry and self-knowledge and really understanding the true self. One has to be discerning discerning between the apparent and, and temporal and the permanent and eternal. And exactly. exactly. And, and, and when one understands that this world is always coming and going, the weather changes, the seasons change, everything in the apparent world is always it's coming cyclical. and going. And that, that, that transient nature of life, when you want to, if you take that as the truth, and you attach yourself to, to life as that is the truth, that's always going to leave you in disarray because it's, again, it's, it's temporal. Now with discernment, the discernment has to come first within yourself. What is the mind and what is the emotions? What, what is the one thing that does not change within you? Because each one of you, the true, the true nature of consciousness itself, which everyone is that consciousness, but it's not every one has consciousness is that everything is within consciousness. Because if you have the model that I'm, I'm a being and I have my consciousness and you're a being and you have your consciousness, we're in divide again, there's division. But if you understand that it's just consciousness and there's seemingly different minds that there's different conditionings and conditioning is not a bad thing, by the way, we'll just, we'll just make it really clear because conditioning is what allows us to have the conversation. Allows us to brush our teeth in the morning. Yeah, allows us to tie our shoes or get dressed. Mm -hmm. Conditioning allows us to actually experience life. But the difference of what we're speaking about is the conditioning that is binding, the conditioning that is limiting. So one must have to discern and the easiest way to discern I mean, this is the age old rule and everyone knows it. Everyone's heard it, but it, it goes without saying really that it's love or fear. Discerning between the choices every day between love and fear. Fear creates this binding and love is an ever expanded, expansive freedom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to give a very simple tool for all of the people as you spoke of that will watch now and in the future. As everything is transient, as everything has its beginning, its middle and its conclusion, every phase of life, every flower starts in its bloom and ends up in its death to give birth and bring about a new, a new flower. That energy goes into the earth and creates more and more and more if anybody's going through anything at this moment, it is transient. There is no question about it. It will not last, it cannot last. And so for anyone to think back into other times in their life, maybe their teenage years, when they were in a situation and they felt, oh my goodness, 
you know, maybe they were humiliated or maybe they were hurt in a relationship and felt that really their world was going to crumble and end. And maybe it did, but then it rebirthed itself and a new life was brought forth, a new recognition, a new evolution of beingness. And this is the nature of the world. It is the nature of the worldly experience. And so as it always is, it always shall be. And how you dance in life is how you do everything in life. And so how you interact with yourself in your own mirror, in your own reflection, when you look at yourself in the mirror, that is the way in which, and that is the model that you will view absolutely everything in life. Do you look in the mirror with judgment? Do you say, oh, I'd like to change this, or oh, I'm not so happy about this, or, you know? Or do you look in the mirror and say, absolutely stunning, all of it, every single aspect of it? Because this universe seeks and only knows perfection. And this is a universe that was created from only love and only the pure source of that love will and can be brought through. But it isn't about trying to change the outside reflections or the outside world. It is about changing the inner world so that you can frequent at another level and experience a completely different reality. I love the cadence of both your voices so much. <laughs> like, oh, can you just read me to sleep, please? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's getting me going. Um, I'm reading this book right now, speaking of, I'm reading this book right now that is, um, well, regardless of the story, um, one of the, the pieces that she writes about is that she's creating um, her own understanding of the world and she calls God change. And the, the, just to, to be in love with God or to be in love with that transient piece of, of human experience. Cause yes, like, I love what you're saying that, that there is this aspect of matter, like, like actual matter in the world. It, it has a transient movement, but not to get attached to the, the ebbs and flows of, you know, the body that's 80% water and you know, things that, that move. Um, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm not trying to equate that to what you're saying, but I'm just saying like that it hit me in that way because I'm in, deep in this book. <laughs> um, oh, I'd love to hear a little bit from our viewers. Do you have any questions or, or any comments about the sovereign, the, and the reign over the lower mind? Scott? Um, there is, yeah, there is a question that came in, which I'll read in a moment. Um, but I have a little something that I wanted to kind of put forth. So as human beings that we are, um, and moving from were reaction to the external world, those times we're grasping to make something different because we're very uncomfortable with what's happening in present time. Um, and so our kind of animal response, our animal reaction is to try and change it because it's so uncomfortable, um, which obviously happens a lot. Earlier today, when we were conversing privately, we talked about the power of radical acceptance as a step, you know, like when the world is coming at us and we're scared and we are in fear or we are in reaction to, to shift from that place, which is so common for us, into a place of uh, calm, that radical acceptance is a way to do that or a step to remember. So I wanted to bring that up and then put the spotlight on our guests 
for any additional thoughts you have for when people are still learning how to practice movement from reaction to, to peace and love with him. Yeah, that's beautiful, dear Scott, because you're right. That is a powerful technique to really transform that model of attachment that then creates the bind, that then creates the suffering. When one accepts life just as it is, just, just however it shows up, just accepting life as it is, not trying to change things, not trying to fix things, but just accepting it as it is and getting out of the duality of the, of the victim and the victor sort of mentality, but just having that acceptance. And, and what can help assist in that process is understanding really the, 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 the very primal instinctual nature of, of all sentient life, which is pleasure and pain, really, you know, desire and aversion knowing that these are the two polarities that literally make you make choices in every single moment, you know, desiring more pleasure and evading the pain. And you go into that, but if you get out of that model first, if you break free of that model and see it as it is, see that it's a nervous system chemical response. That's basically there to, to help you in certain situations and certain times to actually as a self-defense mechanism, like the nervous system itself, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system is, is operating that, that, mm -hmm. that fight, fright right. or freeze response. Mm -hmm. And so once you get out of that, 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 lower, that lower mind and you, and you start becoming more aware of the propensity of these, these choices and becoming more aware of those choices, those actions, mm -hmm. then you can see it as it is first. You know, you can see how there is conditioning at that level. And, and then you can start investigating, what are you attached to? You start investigating your attachments because it's not so much your attachment so much in the, in the world, because if we really think about it, how can you be attached to anything? You know, if you, you might think you're attached, you might think you're attached to the body and then you drop it and you go into another lifetime. Yeah, you're <laughs> you really might, so attached to it. You know, you might think you're attached to certain things, but they are fleeting. They are coming and going. So when you really investigate and inquire about your attachments, you realize that you actually can't be attached to anything. You might think you're attached, but actually you actually can't be attached to anything. So there's freedom already. That's what we're implying is you're already free from that notion of, of these attachments. But what you have to rediscover is your emotional investments. When you are invested into outcomes, when you're invested to outcomes that be a certain way, to look a certain way, to feel a certain way, to have certain things, when you're invested into that, what that does is goes back you, know, you have to go back to discernment between what is real and what is unreal. Because if you're attached to something that is temporary, like the weather, if you're attached to the weather always being good, in your perspective of what is good, you're never going to be, you're never going to allow yourself to feel joy. And, and this is where the bind comes into place. You know, we say the lower mind holds the bind. And it is because all of these conditionings, all of these impressions of life, the way society believes one should be, the way the, the media portrays things. There's no truth in any of it. The true reality is one that is intangible. The true reality is a reality that is eternal. The true reality is a reality that will not and cannot be found until, and I happen to love this word, God is allowed in and out. And a truly, we truly feel and what we know beyond this world is that there is no bind, which means there's nothing you can really be attached to. And so if you're willing to even say, okay, you know, everyone wants to be happy. No one wants to be uncomfortable. Why? Why not? Answer the question, why not? Why doesn't anyone want to be uncomfortable? Because we've been taught and conditioned to think that that is an experience that we don't want to have. Why? <laughs> I 
Well, well, we also have this reptile brain that when it perceives the possibility of danger, the possibility of attack, it does send a synapse to, as, as you mentioned before, and we all of a sudden we choose fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And so there is a biological thing. You know, what's interesting is when a human baby is conceived, the very first thing formed in the first 24 hours is actually what becomes the reptile brain. And uh, the entire brain stem and body is built around it. So there is within our biology, mm -hmm. a, a very clear design for survival. We are designed to survive. And therefore pain or the threat of pain, which threatens our survival, is, is a biological function that I do think that part of the, the beautiful work that, that you teach and have experienced is learning how to transcend that particular biology. Absolutely. Can I say something before yeah. we move on. That there can uh, just, just cause I'm now you got me thinking about it. I'm like, th there is that, that reptilian brain but I don't think that we were I don't think that it was like trying to get away from that. Like, I think that that's a conditioned belief that that those feelings are bad or wrong or unwanted in some ways. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Like, that's, I don't think that that was a natural thing. Like early humanoids, you know, just experienced whatever they were experiencing and they didn't have the judgment around it. They weren't like, oh, these are bad feelings. Like, <laughs> we're all on this roller coaster of life. We're, we're at Disneyland. Woo! It's fun. Well, you know, and tomorrow we're going to talk about on Saturday Night Alive, we're going to be celebrity coast hosting with Scott and Deborah and all a bunch of other beautiful beings. And we're going to be talking about the new human race and the new human. And guess what? The new human is not equipped like that, it's not designed like that. We don't. We don't have that, right? So there's an immediate freeing in that. And hopefully that gives everyone hope as well that as you evolve and in order to evolve, you've got to excavate. You've got to go through these uncomfortable moments so that you come out the other side. Yeah, because when you do, when you really go deep into those moments that make you feel uncomfortable, something magical happens this is why we always say that your treasure your triggers, triggers are, are your treasures. are your treasures mm -hmm. because when you really sit in that that perceptual uncomfortable state when you sit with that your entire body actually rewires itself and reconfigures itself the entire nervous system it wants to sort of jump out and move and move but after a while you sit in that stillness you come into your neutrality and you sit there your your brain chemistry the axon and neurons start rewiring themselves mm -hmm. and then you start transcending the model of your chemistry because you are well more powerful than the chemistry that's dictating your conditioned response and so when got when when you start bringing your awareness back to what is good and bad you're always going to come into this this, this duality but acceptance what dear Scott shared earlier, that is a powerful tool. And we just want to go back into that because when you accept one of the very first initiations one goes through on, on deep spiritual psychology, how to live a spiritual life, how to live an authentic spiritual life. After you get over the, the, the desire and aversion and you get over the pleasure pain principle and you start having a more of a disciplined lifestyle, not so much of you, 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 you live with such structure and become rigid, but, but you have a discipline to do your practice, to meditate, to, to, to have time with yourself, to have deeper inquiry. And you start being more conscientious of what, what food you're putting into your, your body and, and, and what words you're actually speaking out of your body. Yes, and, yes. and you're becoming more conscious in your, in your, in your path. And when you become authentic around that, when you recognize that, the causal body, the causal conditioning, the very the latent unconscious minds and how that's informing the minds. When there's an acceptance that maybe you're not in control, 
maybe the little ego isn't in control. And there, and there's an, and there's an awareness there that the, the very, the model of the self, the small self that has been trying to fight its way to control life, that I want this and I deserve this and I'm entitled to that, that whole model, when, either. when, when that, when that perspective is, is turned inwardly to reflect that that I is just filled with limitations in order for you to realize beyond it. And when you realize beyond that little I, sovereignty, spirit, bliss, peace, happiness, beauty, divinity, when you realize beyond that small self, those are the beautiful attributes that remain. And it's just one source of love. And your awareness becomes absorbed into that true nature, the true nature of, of love at its perfection, bliss in its authenticity. And so that's, that, that whole conditioning is there, designed in order for you to have your own unique experience. And it's so beautiful how that's everyone has their own unique experience to walk up the mountain of their own spiritual journey to discover their true self and everyone's condition conditioning is dictating the way that they're 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 maybe attracted to some teachers and maybe not by others and and their whole conditioning is informing them to remember their true self and when that true self becomes fully aware revealed. and awakened and revealed and realized that divine human that has always been there, the entire genetic template, the entire light body energetic field, your entire beingness that is the vehicle and the temple of God starts becoming illuminated. And in that way, all these chemistries that used to create this model of duality of, between fear and love become so absorbed in love that you can't get angry even if you tried. <laughs> You, you just start you, laughing. You, you, you can't get upset even if you try to get upset because you have awakened that faculty within the mind to see through it in full transparency. And, and the way that you get there, first, accept life as it is, discern between what is true and what is false. The real and the unreal. Real and the unreal. What is temporal? What is permanent? Be disciplined with your path, with your practice, because what follows with discipline is actually joy. And freedom. No one ever meditates and goes, oh, I wish I didn't meditate today. No one ever does yoga and gets on the mat and goes, oh, I wish I didn't do that. Anyone that follows a practice, there's a beautiful joy that follows. So discipline and joy go together like two hands washing each other. We always say self-discipline equals self-love and self-indulgence equals self-loathing. And, and so when you look at yourself really honestly, like have radical honesty, where are there some aspects in your life where you're creating the rub, where you're creating the friction, what, what beliefs are limiting you? Investigate those beliefs. And how is that then reflecting in the reality that you're living in? How does it reflect in your family of origin? How does it reflect in your friends? How does it reflect in your coworkers? How does it reflect in what you watch and witness, what you choose to focus and place your sacred energy and attention onto? Yes, because if you're triggered, there's a clear reflection for you. Your, your literal nervous system and, and, your, and your mind is teaching you to look inside, excavate that, because love, true unconditional love, is a mind that's completely unconditioned. Unconditional love unconditions the mind. And then you go from this cause and effect to an a causal reality where you're just in flow. You're just in your radiance. You're just in your bliss. But the problem is everyone wants to get there without doing the work. And so sovereignty, getting back to the subject, there's this spiritual bypasses. No, I just, I'm because I'm bliss. Oh, no, I'm really bliss. So I just, I'm, I'm just going to do this. And I'm going to. But gonna, I'm going to fight for this. Uh, or I'm going to negate responsibility. Well, gonna, exactly. And then, then it creates this, again, this bind because you haven't excavated the very causal conditioning that is creating that association of this this duality 
But when you take full responsibility, then you recognize that you are the creator of your reality. You're the only one that creates your reality. But your reality is not created from the level of the mind. It can never be. It's created from the level of the causal, karmic, samskaric program and impressions that are latent within. And when you excavate that, you go deep within by literally, you can do very something very, very simple by just coming to your center. We teach this all the time. It's called find your 12, 12 o'clock. You basically visualize a, a clock with a small hand and a big hand pointing up. What that does is brings your biocircuitries inside your physical biology to actually integrate the, the, the pranic or the chi life force, the life force current to actually go into a vertical point. And what happens when you just visualize 12 o'clock, all your energy becomes verticalized. And then you get to just be aware of being neutral. And when you're neutral, when you're centered, when you're in the center of your being, you can see what pulls you out what pulls you out. And when you see what pulls you out, you can see, is there a bind there? Is there emotional investment there? If there is to a certain food, to a certain program, to a certain thing, a certain, certain action, a certain thought, a certain belief, if it pulls you out of your center, investigate it. Is that, is that worth holding on to? Is that worth believing in? And if it's not, let it go. And that's as simple as it is. And, and you can literally pierce through the veil of maya, the veil of delusion, the veil of, of all duality, just by having that precision with discernment and that precision with neutrality. And from that space, you attract life. You don't try to try to chase life and start chasing. You just attract. You just sit here and allow it to come to you. Yeah. I'm really loving everything you're saying. And a couple of things I want to just riff on and emphasize. The very last thing, not grasping, but being receptive. Noticing when am I grasping for something? When am I trying to get something? Versus when is it that I trust and with faith am allowing it to come? The other thing that I, I wanted to riff on, and I love kind of the the strong uh, assertive tone to what you're encouraging us to do, which is to do the work and let it start at least one way for it to start is noticing all judgments. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I had a mentor who said, Scott, I'm challenging you. Every time you're in judgment, I want you to notice it. And I was humbled to see that I had somewhere between one and 200 judgmental thoughts every day. <laughs> Um, and I thought I was like a spiritual guy, but it's like, oh my God, every thought has a judgmental quality to it. Even if the judgment is, wow, Trish is really beautiful. Wow, Shakina is really smart. Wow, Sananda is really, you know, right on, whatever it is, those are still judgmental thoughts. They're still comparative. So noticing when are we in judgment? And there's so much judgment going on right now and it breaks my heart mm -hmm. because almost everybody who watches our shows and almost everybody that I interact with wants to experience peace in the world. But then two minutes later, they're judging someone who got vaccinated or judging someone who didn't get vaccinated mm -hmm. or judging somebody who is blue or judging someone who's red. Right. And so it's like just noticing all those judgments that keep us trapped in the polarity trapped in the samsara and and really so, yes beloved scott thank you we, mm -hmm. a little bit of I, know, I just wanted to riff on those yeah. things i do want to there's some great questions that have come in so i'm going to read a couple at a time and then you can decide which ones you want to tackle um and thank you everybody who's been patient with your questions judith writes in creating a sovereign life then is it creating intentions and creating that reality or accepting what each moment is bringing to you like part of the flow? That's one question. Another so, question. Oh, let me give you a second one. So one of you can answer one and the other one can ruminate on the other if you like. The other question, the next one to put out there is what is the ideal relationship between the observer, or I am, and the observed, my body and my mind, my external reality. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. 
So the first question being intention setting or just full acceptance to what comes. It's not one or the other. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of both here. What we're encouraging everyone to do is investigate what your intentions are. Because you might have the intention to live a happy, peaceful life, but then you're in an argumentative relationship that you're complaining and you're projecting and you're blaming your partner every single day, but you're saying you want to have the intention of a peaceful, coherent life. So you have to investigate what do you really desi desire first? And what do you really desire? And and we're not saying do it one way or not do the other. It's about really excavating what your intentions are in life. What is your propensities? What are you attracted to? What are your, what is the calling? And is that, why? yeah. And why? Because why? is that freeing you? Is that, is that, is there a feeling within your heart that opens up and it makes your body relax and goes, yes, yes, yes. That is the way that I wish to live. Or is it actually, well, I want to be that, but that's only for really that's special like people kids, because I have this, and I've yeah. got a husband. Because I've got, got a life to live and I live in a 3D world. <laughs> and, and, and so really investigate those belief models because what happens when you, when you look at life through new eyes with innocence, you see that anything's possible in every single moment. But if you're letting the mind condition and recondition that, no, you can't do this. You're not worthy for this. You, you can set all the intentions in your world, but they're never going to come true because you've got these unconscious belief systems. It doesn't matter what intention you set. It doesn't matter what decrees. It doesn't matter what affirmations. That's not going to do anything for you. Because what happens is, again, the, the, the unconscious mind that hasn't been dealt with comes back into the forefront and creates this this again, this overlay of, of disbelief almost. So what we suggest to, to be free from, from both actually, needing to set intentions and needing to just accept life of what comes, comes forward, know that within you, deep, deep within you, you are already whole and complete. Nothing that you could get or you could experience or you could receive could ever change that. You absolutely are. And when you know that and you, and you tune into that and you really feel in your heart with that, then what flows from life mm -hmm. is revealing everything that may not actually believe that. And then it's up to you to re-imprint into your reality that truth back within yourself. Because who you truly are is whole and complete. Now, the mind itself will do its thing. And when you witness it and you sit in that space of neutrality, it will, it will rise and then it will, then it will dissolve. And everything that has, be, has created this duality between what you like and what you dislike, what remains is actually peace. Peace from the mind, because only the mind is actually making the choices of what I need, what I want. But when you come from the heart, when you come from the center of your being, you could never have anything that could add to something that already is complete. Mm. Judith, who asked that, that first question, Judith, who asked that question, writes, yes, I get it. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. And I'd like to add just one piece, a bit more, not a bit more, but also scientific in its nature. It's to understand the small self and, and the eternal presence with the particle and the wave, right? The particle self is the particle that says, I am this, I am that, I intend this, I want this. It's the willfulness versus the wave is the all. I am open to all that is perceivably going to be elevating for me in my next reality. 
I am open to the all that is in its most illuminated form to help my process. And I trust and surrender into that wholly, eternally and completely. And if it's uncomfortable and if it's painful, so be it. And allow for that to have its own blossoming and its own expression of beauty without judgment. And so the wave and the particle, do you wish to be the particle or are you in fact the wave? Are you the ocean of consciousness or are you a physical wave that is needing to move in a certain direction? And when you begin to understand that and not only understand it, but inner stand it and live as it, there is no thought any longer. There is nothing that is needed to be directed because you are the direction itself and the force that moves it. And, and that beautifully complements the second question as well, the, <laughs> the observer and the observed. Mm -hmm. and, and just to also just expand upon this important question that I'm sure many actually would like to know how to live in that. It's all vibration. It's, it's getting your internal state aligned because when you're in love, you're in the highest vibration that this universe literally unfolds with grace and effortlessness too. But what happens when one goes, I, okay, I'm only going to choose love. I'm not going to longer choose fear anymore. I'm only going to choose love. The universe goes, Oh, really? Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, how about what, yeah, what, with this? You, you know, what, what about if this happens? And then this happens. And then this happens. What about love then? Oh, forget love. This is so frustrating. And it's like, I'm going to no. fight against this. If and you... I'm going to believe that and subscribe to this. Yeah. So what so, just happened with all I want is, is love. So, I choose love. So, love, if you want love, if you, because first of all, you are love. <laughs> So if you want to be your true, true self as that expression of love like, in um, all moments, love doesn't say, I like this, I don't like that. Love shows up in unconditional expression. So what happens when a trigger arises because life isn't flowing to what you want, when you return to love and you t return to neutrality, you t return to 12 o'clock, unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, compassion for the experience it unconditions the mind. The mind starts unwinding itself in order for love to be the vibration that then starts re-encoding your reality. And so when you actually experience those uncomfortable situations or those uncontrollable situations mm -hmm. and you return to, to the, your neutrality to open up your heart into what love truly is and its perfection, that literally re-encodes your genetic imprint and your genetics is the very film that is projecting your reality. And so mm -hmm. when you change your frequency, you change your entire reality. And, and that's, the, that's the quest that everyone's on is rediscovering themselves, literally illuminating themselves by going deep within themselves to see what they don't love about the self, the small self, what they don't love about others, what they don't love about the world, what they don't love or like. About their own mirrors. About their mirrors and what they're in judgment with, what they're in projection with. When you stop the projection, when you stop the judgment, when you stop that and love just for the sake of love because you are love and you have fierce love that is fearless in the face of anything that you choose or you experience in life. That is the love that we talk about that will set you free. That is the love is, that is, leads you to salvation. That is the love that is liberating. But you have to be radical to choose that in all moments and, and, and never allow the mind to waver you away from that fierce love that you know true to be your true self. Because that is the observer. That unconditional love is the observer. And the apparent observed, mm -hmm. well, that is the coming and going. Love the observer, love the true self and the relationship of what appears in one's life. That is something that 
is an appearance for you to experience, but not be attached to the outcome of it. That's right. And one can never really know anything. You can never really know anything. The moment you see something, it changes. The moment you put your eyes on something, your gaze, your awareness, it becomes only seen and experienced through your filter. And nothing means anything. It is what one ascribes it to mean that then creates the reality as it will unfold from there. And so the observer is the permanence. This observer, the true self that's being it's observed. Not just, just right now, it's the most easiest experience that you can actually have this self-awareness. Like if we ask you a question, who is aware? The mind will naturally go, I am. I'm aware. But what is awareness? What is awareness? Just take a moment, close your eyes, just do this simple, simple exercise. What is awareness? What is aware? Without using the vocabulary of the mind, what is aware? You cannot answer that question because as soon as you try to answer that question, the mind kicks in again. But when you just focus your awareness on awareness, which is known as upasana in Sanskrit, which is revealing the truth of one's awareness, when you focus on that, you create this feedback loop that instead of looking out there to the apparent reality is, oh, there's a sky, there's trees, there's cars, there's people, there's, with that, with your energy is going outward. When you go back to awareness of truth of love, and, and we use love, awareness, peace, consciousness, spirits, you know, Nirvana. And all interchangeable. And that when you bring your awareness back to that sensor point, you create this feedback loop that it literally reconnects you back to yourself and it revitalizes you. It creates this aliveness within. And that, that is permanent. That is the true self. It's uh, just a little moment I was playing with it. It was beautiful exercise, and you're right, because it's like the mind was, well, I'm aware, and, you know, what wants to define it. But I love that we just keep bringing it back, bringing it back. Um, I want to let people know about a, a couple of things. Um, definitely, I want to encourage everyone to go to this beautiful website, uh, and it's twinray.com, T-W-I-N-R-A-Y.com. And uh, it's a beautiful site and they have created some really wonderful gifts for us. So um, I joined today, I received the gift. They've got a beautiful app. You can download their apps and really start immediately doing the practice, doing the wonderful work that they've created. Um, so I wanna encourage everybody go to twinray.com right now, put in your name, your email address, get your free gift, um, and really begin to receive uh, the beautiful um, wisdom and practical applications that Shakina and Sananda have put together. I um, also want to remind everybody that tomorrow night, as he mentioned, we are going to dedicate Saturday Night Alive to the Global Peace Tribe. Hopefully all of you have seen that show, but if you haven't, it is a beautiful, powerful, inspirational, virtual variety show. Um, and tomorrow night, we're going to be very much focusing on the Twin Rays and the teaching, all about experiencing the sacred alchemy of the divine human in the new earth. Um, and in addition to Shakina and Sananda, we've got a few other wonderful teachers, presenters, luminaries. And we also have a wonderful magician, Sean Jay. He's one of our favorite magicians. And we have two musical artists playing music. And so it's gonna be a wonderful weaving of different uh, experiences. So that's tomorrow night at six o'clock. Um, but we have a, an early Zoom room show. So if you register, you go to globalpeacetribe.com and register, uh, you can come into the Zoom room at 5.30 where we'll have a private chat with Shakina and Sananda um, and also Maid Benedicte, one of our other luminaries. 
So this is an opportunity to go even deeper. And then on Sunday, we have our Sacred Sunday show where we're gonna take more questions and answers. Um, we are close to wrapping up, but I wanted to, there were quite a few questions that came in about climate change, pain in Afghanistan, sexual fantasy, the dark side of life. It was interesting how many people had questions about, well, where does your love come into here and how do you stay in a love state when people are suffering or people are uncomfortable? And even though I know you kind of answered it in some ways, I just want to acknowledge several questions that came in that were kind of, I think, rooted in the, but there's so much pain in the world and how can you just preach love when there's so much pain? Um, uh, and again, I, I, I know you have kind of answered it in a way, but I also want to acknowledge all those questions that came in that are kind of from that frequency. I will share something briefly. If you are one who has so much pain inside of you, you will be one who always experiences the pain of the world. Once you release yourself completely, you will be the witness but you will not feel the pain and you will not feel the need to feel the pain. And you will understand that the greater purpose from a much higher perspective is that all souls are living their karma and their karma has been created for lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes. And as not only this earth is in its ascension journey, but the solar system is ascending and the galaxy is ascending and everything is in its ascension. All that is hidden, buried and covered up beneath the surface, all that has been unrevealed for lifetimes and is in fact in the grids of the earth and the soils and the waters has to come. And this is these fruits have been sown for a very, very long time. And now it's time to allow whatever is going to happen and trust in the divine plan at all moments, no matter what. And this doesn't mean you are void of compassion. It means that you are enlivened in compassion. with compassion, mm -hmm. but it's a detached compassion. It's not a compassion that holds the pain associated with the, the world itself. The world will always change. The world will always go through its phases. It will go through its cycles. And when there's all this pain in the world that one sees and experiences, beneath all of that, the very, the very nature that life is enabled to actually have incarnation, to have a life is from the gift of love. And so even to experience pain or even to experience pleasure, or experience all of that, going back to the fundamental nature that the miracle of life is. And sometimes there's ignorance and there's, there's three different aspects of how the matter world plays out. And we'll just make this really, really simple and understood is that there's three different aspects in the Vedantic Eastern terminology. It's known as the gunas. Um, in science, in modern science, it's just known as the different aspects of the particle. And so one is the tamastic, one is the rajastic, and one is the sattvic. These are different rates of frequency, essentially. At the tamastic level, at the shadow level, that's what that means. There's nothing but ignorance. One that has ignored the truth. One has, victimization. one has ignored the self. And that's where there's war. That's where there's this duality of opposition and plays out. And then the other energy is the, the, the level of the ambition, the, 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 the empowered self. Um, that that level of that's the level T that screams sovereignty. Yeah, that's the level of the sovereign, the one that wants the sovereignty, the the, the, the empowered ego. That that level 
what that wishes there's no there's no real mutual benefit there it's more that there's in it for one's oneself there is a selfish it's a service to self structure yeah. and model no matter how it is miraged to appear and that's sort of the the, the positive expression of the of the proton and before was the sort of the the, the negative impulse now the neutral impulse the sattvic nature the 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 pure nature there's no push pull there's no push pull there's a there's a there's a neutrality there there's a mutual benefit that's where the word bodhisattva the the, the mind the bodhi the intellect is sattvic is pure is not in friction with life is in having a smooth journey when when one being comes into that recognition of their pure self they're not trying to take from another there's this there's this beautiful mutual benefit that unfolds together in harmony the world and the universe will always play through these three different gunas these three different aspects of energies these these the, the shadow um, the empowered individual and, and the friction quite noble. and and the, the, the frictionless pure expression and it will always play in and out of that but that again is the play that is the play if you take the reality for truth you're never going to find freedom but coming back to recognize whatever screen that you are experiencing the screen itself never doesn't get changes. damaged you know whatever projects onto the screen the different scenes of the movie the different scenes of life the different experiences of life come and go and change but the very nature of the screen itself the awareness itself it's it's eternal it doesn't change it never can be destructed become destroyed or have or experience destruction of any kind when you bring your awareness to that level which is the fundamental reality that is truth that is love that is peace then you have compassion for the play but you're not caught up into the drama and into the trauma you see it as it is and you allow it to be as it is and if you are in the in your immediate reality where you have something that you can change and you can do from a righteous nature you shall do that but not try to change things that are literally out of your control. You come back to compassion, come back to your heart. And these, mm -hmm. these interesting experience of suffering allows one to know greater compassion. And so until one does not know compassion, one will not experience suffering. Once you realize the truth of compassion, you embody compassion, you live compassion, you express as compassion, there is no more suffering. And all that come back to that truth, don't experience that suffering. Because mm -hmm. suffering is only at the level of the mind, but you transcend that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, as you say that, I'm reminded of the story of Prince Siddhartha, who wanted, as this, you know, very beautiful, dynamic young man, wanted to alleviate all the suffering in the world. And after years and years of traveling and seeing how large the world was and that suffering was everywhere, even in the highest level ashrams that he went into, when he collapses under the Bodhi tree and he finally accepts there is suffering, that's when he became the Buddha of compassion. And so it's an important uh, piece there because so often we do think that we have to alleviate the suffering or we have to take on the suffering we're somehow not doing our job if we don't alleviate it but when we accept it doesn't mean we condone hurtful behavior but when we accept that there is suffering that's actually when we reach a true state of compassion that's not the ego attachment of playing rescuer or caregiver but absolutely being present to what is and 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 really accessing our own little inner buddha nature mm -hmm. uh, at least that's and, how i'm interpreting what you're saying and that's that's true beloved scott and just to add another piece to that when siddhartha realized there is suffering he also went far deeper than that and got and recognized the real from the unreal. And that even though there was the perception of suffering that 
when he went into the states that he went into, the somatic states in various levels, that's when he realized that it all dissolved and that in fact, there was no suffering. Who can suffer if it's only one pure spirit? If everything is one pure spirit, who is there to suffer? The ego? Well, we've just established that that is not who you are. The mind? Well, you're not even that. If there is just a pure expression of love, pure expression of consciousness, God, source, whatever word is, is associated with that connection of deep, deep love to the true self, who is there that suffers? And, and that, that's what Buddha came to understand. And that reality with someone that hasn't integrated and matured to that, that can be quite, that can be something that again, can be this, this play out of spiritual bypassing. Oh, there's no one that suffers. There's nothing. Everything's an illusion. That's not That's what we're not saying at, at all. all what we're, saying. we're not saying anything of the like. What we're saying is when you realize the, the seeing reality as it is, how it plays out, in its, in its natural nature of playing out the different cycles. And you're not attached to your definition of perfection, your definition of what you want it to look like. You're not living from entitlement. When, when you see it as it is, it no longer has its grip on you. And you have greater compassion because all beings must go through a level of suffering in order to realize their true self. Mm -hmm. And so just to return back to sovereignty and to just recapitulate for one moment, from our perspective, from the perspective of a risen spiritual recognition and awareness, one can never truly be sovereign unless they are reigning over the ego, over the lower mind, and one who is deeply conditioned will only always behave from that conditioning and not from that purest expression of the source of all things. And as we're evolving into that golden age, which we are living here as it's right now, it's here, there is no suffering, not because we're literally not looking, but there is no suffering because when one evolves beyond the ignorant model of ignoring truth and one returns to truth and when all beings return to truth, there is no suffering, there is harmony, there is synergy, there is unity. And then you evolve beyond those control systems whether it be governmental, political, you know, financial, whatever those playouts are, the collective evolves to a certain level of consciousness where there, those models just don't exist anymore because mm -hmm. suffering is truly a choice. But it's just not but, time yet because humanity hasn't learned. Yeah, and when clearly, but but it's the awakening's here. We are we are great optimists in that knowing, and and there is a threshold. All this chaos that is being perceived is just creating a new order. You know, when, when a mother's giving birth, birth, you know, there's a birth mm -hmm. of a child you know, until she learns to really have an orgasmic blissful birth. But if, the, if that isn't apparent, it seems as if there is this very intense experience, but then there's new life that comes from. And that, 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 that beautiful order that comes from that perceptual chaos is what's happening right now is the whole world is rebirthing the collective is rebirthing and then we're going to be at a state we'll be in a golden age where truth is the reality and suffering is an illusion that is seen through and is not a choice that is made but love is the choice and the only truth that one experiences and in fact those beloveds those of you those beautiful people who are watching again now or in the future in this timeless expression Know that if you truly choose love in all moments, if you truly choose to speak only love, to recognize what sacredness is coming out of your mouth, how words create worlds and the spelling that you're doing into the world, recognize that 
for all of you beloveds, you will be raised to a different frequency matter world to have a different reality because it is merited and you have earned it. And that is a promise. Oh, that's a beautiful, Grateful. that's a beautiful note. And um, <coughs> go ahead, Trish. Oh, I was just deeply grateful for your wisdom and your love to be shared out in vibrational resonance. Even when I was gone, I could just still feel very connected. And I'm so grateful to have you on the show. And, and thank you for giving us this incredible download. The reminder I want to, of the truth. I want to read just a couple of uh, comments that just came in. Angela writes, I choose love and to release all body pain now. Um, and uh, DJ Jew wrote, writes, when absolute truth is heard, it frees you and opens the heart. Thank you for this enlightening satsang. Absolutely. And um, Mark, who's one of our regulars, wrote, Powerful direct communication. This is so valuable. Thank you for the reminder of our true nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you so much, Twin Rays. And tomorrow night, we get more opportunity to connect with them. And between now and then, please go to the website, twinray.com. There are gifts waiting you. And I know that for some of you, some of what you heard was kind of challenging because it's a very different perspective of reality. Be as open. Remember when he was talking about be like a little child that's curious, right? The judgmental mind wants to hold on and collect evidence to support our beliefs. But remember Einstein wrote, the true measure of intelligence is how quickly we can change our beliefs. And so if we're willing to let go of the beliefs that we might have and be curious, be childlike in our wonder of really, could we really be ascending? Could ascension really be happening? Could I really have that beautiful experience that they're describing? Could I be living in that state? Yes, let's be open to that and do the work, absolutely mm -hmm. do the work. Beautiful. That was beautifully said, and we're so grateful to be here with you. And we can feel our many, 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 many students that are with us also. And we just love you all so much. Yes. And, and really, just the last comment to be shared is just don't allow the world to tell you who you are. Don't allow the appearance of how it plays out in the world to tell you who you are. Know that you are far beyond this world you transcend this world the love that you truly are transcends all conceptual models of belief and when you acknowledge the freedom that you have of that free will to return to love in all moments be innocent be playful be playful be <laughs> joyful that is your invitation and when you take that invitation You'll have a beautiful life, profound life of great meaning and great purpose. So don't allow anything out there to tell you who you are. Learn it from within your own heart because you are magnificent, beautiful co-creators of this golden age that we're all doing together. Mm -hmm. And we love you, all of you. So much. And thank you. Beautiful. God bless you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Please share this out to your world. That's how more people learn about this beautiful vision of these two beautiful beings. And join us tomorrow night, Saturday Night Alive for the Global Peace Tribe. Just go to globalpeacetribe.com to register and we'll see you all tomorrow night. And thank you again, Shakina, Sananda, Trish, and everybody for watching. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm. Good night.